you wrote last week in the New York Times, and this this, this sort of thing is is really a a, a gut punch, I, I think, tying together, um, you know, the before times. Um, you wrote in the New York Times last week that one of the books that most electrified conservatives over the last fifty years was Ellen Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind, which was published in 1987. And I am old enough to remember this and, and remember what the reaction was there. And as you wrote, it, it warned, uh, The Closing of the American Mind, warned of the dangers posed by moral relativism and nihilism of accepting everything and denying reason's power. And Bloom argued that the denial of truth and the suppression of reason were leading to a crisis of civilization and that that was the fault of the new left. This was embraced universally by conservatives, I, I think, well, close to it. And you at the time were working in the Reagan administration's Department of, of Education. And obviously you were very interested in higher education. I was very interested in higher education. And so at that point, you could almost define uh, conservatism as pushing back against moral relativism and nihilism. What happened, Peter? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of things um, happened, um, and uh, all of them are disquieting and uh, and, dis and and disturbing. Um, one of the things that happened, and I, I quote uh, Rich Taffel, who's the chief executive of Public Squared, who said that um, in his conversations with people on the right that. Um, they try th their narratives. They tried fighting the left for years, yeah. um, but the game had changed. And that and that trying to um, go against work against the identity politics of the postmodern left just wasn't working. And so they came to embrace the politics of postmodernism, which basically means that there's no truth. You can make up your own narratives. You can ignore evidence that you that you uh, that you want. Um, and I think that that became for them not only a, a way to win. I, I heard any number of times, and I'm guessing you did too, Charlie, this actually started in 2016. A number of these people, by the way, were Christians that, that I spoke to. And what they said about, about Donald Trump uh, at that time um, is, look, he's a person of flawed character. In, in the conversations I had, they would, mm -hmm. they would admit, whether it was Mitt Romney or John McCain or George W. Bush, Trump's character was worse than 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 uh, than theirs. But what they said is that uh, a version of um, he understands the nature of the struggle. He's going to bring a gun to a cultural knife fight. He understands the enemy. Mm -hmm. These these other people are too genteel. Right. And I still have conversations, literally emails within the last several weeks with people in MAGA world <clears throat> who believe that the left uh, is is not only destructive to everything that they believe in, but is immoral and will use any means and methods necessary. And so one person um, literally told me that Trump is not good and decent, but good and decent doesn't work anymore. And yeah, that he right. was the one person who could. So what they came to, to do is to embrace <clears throat> this kind of nihilistic approach to politics, the will to power. Uh, not going to be constrained by by, so, by yeah. rules or norms. Mm -hmm. So I think no, that's that's well. And this is what you you wrote: is the Republicans have embraced uh, nihilism. Um, you know, the American right most fully embodies the attitudes that alarmed Alan Bloom back in 1987. And then you go through all of this. I mean, just witness the right's embrace of Trump's cruelty, his remorselessness, his vindictiveness, his conspiracy theories. I mean, no other president has been so disdainful of knowledge and annihilating truth each week as statements become more deranged, more menacing, more authoritarian. I mean, the attacks on the prosecutors and judges, we can just run through all of that. The people that he suggests that he would have executed, you know, <clears throat> joking about the attack on Nancy Pelosi's yep. husband. And as you point out, he's wildly popular with the right. And it, as it turns out, his indecency is, is a plus. Right. His supporters are galvanized by the criminal charges against him because now that becomes the signal of that he's being politically persecuted. And so this is what's different in 2016, because he was kind of alone. I remember thinking to myself at one point, OK, Trump's bad, but there are just not a lot of, you know, you know, many Trumps around the country. And now right. we've seen hundreds of imitators across the country. So you wrote the haunting question raised by Alan Bloom is more relevant now than it was when he first posed it. 
when there are no shared goals or a vision of the public good, is the social contract any longer possible? I'm going to turn yeah. the question on you. Is it? It is, but it's it's being challenged. A lot is at stake. Uh, this is a tremendously difficult and disorienting period. In some ways, I think it's it's the greatest threat to the republic since the lead up to the Civil War. I would say that the next 12 months, whether Trump wins this election or not, uh, will go a good distance toward determining the degree to which the republic as we've known it is 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 going to continue and and uh, and and survive um and the le and the right has has not only embraced the postmodernism but with a kind of zeal that even the left didn't and i think it's more widespread on the uh on the right there's a kind of psychic satisfaction that i've seen on the american right you know that we refer to it as 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 you know of of trolling the of uh uh Trolling the libs and owning mm -hmm. the libs, right. we refer to it as, as owning the uh, owning the libs, and there is a kind of delight that people take <clears throat> in being able to make arguments that they want that are removed and distanced from facts. Um, it uh, they, they can just throw out any any narratives that they uh, that they want, and what I think what happened, I think that people at the time, uh, most people who were conservative or the American right embrace the Bloom thesis. I think they would have said that they, they believed it. But I think what happened is over time when they felt like they weren't winning and that the, the, the ends and justify the means came into play and they began a step at a time to discard the moral norms that they had held to, always coming up with a rationalization that, look, we, right. have, to, we have to cut this corner in order to defeat the left because defeating the left and defeating the Democratic Party is primus inter Paris for the survival of the, of the country. And at each step and each accommodation, it became easier to make the next accommodation. And so what was a what was a bug for Don Donald Trump in 2016 became a feature by 20, 2020. And now it's an aspect of, of him in which they, they celebrate it because they feel uh, like he hates yeah. the same people that we do. He drives the left crazy. And anybody that does that is, 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 is somebody that warrants our support. So it's, it's really disturbing. And of course, for people like you and I who grew up in the conservative reform by the conservative movement, it's, it's disorienting. It's very disoriented. It does feel like the upside down world. And in, in yeah. your piece in the Times, you you also reference the work of Jonathan Rausch, uh, who wrote the Constitution of Knowledge, talking about the way the incentive structure. And I think you've hinted at this. The incentive structure has you know really been reversed. I mean, it's played an indispensable role in this this epistemic crisis here because, as as you point out. I think people in the media have discovered that, especially the right right wing ecosystem, have discovered you know that spreading these lies and the resentments is very very profitable. There is an audience for it. people like this; they want it, even if they know it's not true. And this is something that I wrestle with. It's like, do you believe that lie, or do you not care whether it's a lie? That it's just the the utility. As as long as it's the cudgel that triggers the libs, I'm willing to say it. And this goes back to a, a conversation I, I had about Carrie Lake. Is is Carrie Lake nuts or is she just fundamentally thoroughly dishonest? And I'm not sure which is worse. Um, I actually believe that she knows it's all bullshit, but this is what you have to do these days. And they kind of like it. Yeah, it, it's a really good question. And it's a puzzling question. I mean, I think the way I view it is that there's a spectrum. And there's some people who were true believers, uh, yeah. like probably Sidney Powell. Uh, and uh, and then there are people who are deeply cynical, I would say, like yeah. like Lindsey Graham. I do think that uh, for an awful lot of people who are who are Trump supporters and MAGA supporters, it's a combination. And just give me a sec to explain what what sort of my theory is, which is impor yeah. informed by yeah. clinical psychologists and social psychologists that I've talked to which is there's a phenomenon called cognitive dissonance and cognitive dissonance is <clears throat> when you live at odds with what your values are and if you know it and that creates an enormous internal tension uh right think about in a sense of a yeah. of a minister that goes up and, right. and gives a sermon on sunday and has an affair on tuesday or wednesday right. and then comes back the following sunday people probably wonder how how the heck does that person get mm -hmm. away with that <clears throat> without um feeling disgust and self-loathing and i'm i'm like well, what happens? A lot of people that, that have affairs like that, they justify, it. you know, mm -hmm. my, my spouse wasn't paying attention to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to, you know, get out of this. It wasn't working or whatever. 
And so they're able to do it. We all um, have uh, uh, our mind works to allay and mitigate cognitive dissonance. So we're not living in this tension. So in my experience, when I've talked and communicated with people in Trump world and MAGA world and laid out, not in provocative language, but laid out very methodically facts and circumstances, I can see psychologically what they do, which is how they, sh mm -hmm. how they change the conversation, um, how they tend to mitigate how awful Trump is, and then they try and escalate how bad Biden is. So they're basically looking for a draw on the right. morality of Biden and Trump, hence Hunter Biden and so forth. They have to keep in the front of their mind this notion that um, that Biden and the Democrats are an existential struggle. And if you said, look, he's been president for three years, some things you may disagree with, some things you may agree with, but the country is not in, in a markedly worse shape and in some ways better shape than a Trump. It no. doesn't matter. They have to no. hold to this idea and the rationalizations you know, kick in, which is uh, these uh, indictments are political prosecutions and the impeachment was a political prosecution. And we can't trust the evidence because it's the mainstream well, media that that hates him. Well, and, and it is very interesting how effective this is, um, because, uh, you know, I, I, I have written, as, as you have, about Trump's threats to to weaponize uh, the criminal justice system, to have a regime of, of revenge and retribution. And the almost universal response from MAGA world is, first of all, good. Uh, second, but because that is what Democrats are already doing. So that everything yeah. that Trump is saying is simply a mirror of what Joe Biden is doing.